नमस्कार वेलकम टू पी गुरुज प्राइम टाइम टुडे स्पेशल फायर साइड चैट अबाउट इंडिया स्टार्टअप इको सिस्टम टुडे वी हैव अ स्पेशल गेस्ट टी वी मोहन दास पाय अवरे एंड श्रीधर जी विल बी गेस्ट होस्टिंग दिस प्रोग्राम श्रीधर जी बिफोर आई हैंड ओवर द रेंज टू यू आई जस्ट वॉन्ट टच अपॉन वन थिंग अबाउट ट्वेंटी मिनट्स बिफोर आई पुट दिस यू नो स्टार्टेड दिस प्रोग्राम आई पुट आउट अ ट्वीट सेंग दैट ट्रेडिशनल वेयर एंड स्टार्टअप्स have a relationship and i can tell you that uh, india invented the first pant they called it the panchakacham five knots and and if you do it right it is as good a pant as you will ever get there are many ways to tie this five pancha panchakacham at least i have seen 13 to 15 same way the sari can be told i am told tied in, in in many many ways so we are barely you know scratching the surface here and i can tell you some of the social events that i see in and around in the united states uh, the west is really jumping headlong into traditional indian wear especially for formal events and as you will see i'm going to walk the talk as you see i'll share some pictures of um, you know our family where we go through all these things the point i'm trying to make here is this is one of those industries that's perfectly suited for india because you don't need a lot of capital you need imagination you need to be able to deliver what you promise you just need a simple website and you can be in business you can make a lot of money this is just my starting point i don't think mohan das pai avare is going to talk about cottage industries here although he might surprise <laughs> us with that so sridhar ji over to you sir and viewers we are taking questions today on startup ecosystem so please send in your questions we will do that after we have the initial discussion over to you sridhar ji namaskar uh, good afternoon good evening uh, sorry good morning and good evening and early good morning to those in california namaskar uh, mohan das pai avare welcome namaskara. to the program and uh, looking forward to as as always a stimulating discussion uh shri ji so you can chip in as you see appropriate and uh, you know modulate as appropriate so uh, today we're going to talk about uh, the evolution of the indian startup ecosystem and how it is transforming india and what future the indian startup ecosystem holds uh, as india marches to marches towards its 5 trillion dollars economy So Mohanji, if the first question is, uh, where is Indian startup ecosystem today relative to say three, four years ago, and uh, are you satisfied with where India is today? Well, Sridhar, let me give the data where we are today. We have fifty-five thousand startups, fifty-eight unicorns, who have collectively created three hundred and fifty billion dollars of value, employ one point four million people. and have revenues of maybe 60 billion dollars with a valuation of maybe 10 15 billion dollars 3 years ago we were maybe 30 40% of this from 2014 till 2020 december we got 50 70 billion dollars of capital coming in this year we already got 12 billion dollars of capital by now this year we already got about maybe 18 unicorns and end of the year we will probably have 25 unicorns for this year because there's a rush of money that is coming this year we just had our first ipo of uh, zomato which doubled from the ipo price in 3 trade days of trading and today that's possibly worth about maybe 16 17 billion dollars for a valuation uh, which was just short of maybe 8 billion dollars and it is one of those delivery companies food delivery companies but it's got great technology and i believe that by 2025 we'll have more than 100000 startups and 150 unicorns who will create 1 trillion dollars of value and possibly employ 3 and a half million people and we will get from january 1 2021 till 25 we will get possibly 150 to 200 billion dollars of capital coming in so we're seeing this enormous surge of innovation and Uh, you know prosperity in this particular area particularly in south india but i must tell you this sridhar this is built upon the fantastic work of the software service companies you know well that of the top 10 software service companies by market value five are indian of the top five three are indian and they are the 2.8 million employees there one per 2 billion are indians and the united states in my view has 6 million software people 1 million are indians 
of the 5 million employed in this industry, 2.5 million work for American companies. Out of 8.5 8 working for American companies, but in India and the US, 3.5 million are Indians. 60% of global outsourcing comes to India. And this year, we're exporting $170 billion of software, more than the oil that Saudi Arabia exports. This is the base on which we are building. And this year, between the service industry and the startups, India is going to hire 400,000 to 500,000 engineers. This is huge, man. And by 2030, I believe, we'll have 10 million people in this industry. And uh, the software service industry, the big five have a market value of $350 billion. And adding the smaller ones, $400 billion. And I believe by 2025, between the startups and the software service companies, the listed value will be close to a trillion dollars. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine what is happening in this country. And so many young people are starting having startups, you know, many succeeding, etc. Great, great. No, thanks for that uh, context setting, Mohan. I think you, you touched on two important themes. When we take the established industries, as you rightly talk, talk about, speak about, you know, the top five services companies, you know, they have done the, the hard nuts and bolts and the fundamental engineering of not only the infrastructure, but also the core software uh, that drives the many, many industries in United States as well as around the globe. But when you take the outcome and when you take the impact, it is directly tangible in a balance sheet. There, there is no flaky stuff. Right. So in other words, when, when I take in JP Morgan, you know, if at that point of time when I left JP Morgan, we had an IT budget of close to five billion dollars. So of which we say, you know, let's say two and a half billion dollars we allocate towards what we call business as usual, which is maintenance and management. And part of it goes towards hardware and part of it. We can then translate and say, OK, if we give this part to an outsourced enterprise, it tangibly results in outcome from efficiency plus redeployment of the capital. So there is a direct correlation to employment. There's a direct correlation to the outcome and to the GDP of the country in terms of the output. Then many of these new companies that are coming in, in especially in India, uh, how, does, how do they evolve to this mainstream integration from a startup mode to be adjacent to the main drivers of economic value, which is the top five companies, as you rightly pointed out. Shida, let me give you an example, which is easy to understand. We have Ola, which competes with Uber for, you know, for cars for the cab service in India. Ola is now setting up a two-wheeler electric vehicle factory to produce one million two-wheelers. And uh, India possibly produces about maybe 15, 16 million two-wheelers a year is the largest producer of two-wheelers in the world, right? And we got Aether, which is producing. Now, they're forcing Hero Honda, the largest one, we produce about 7 million two-wheelers a year, to produce e you know, electric, electric two-wheelers. And the Bajaj people are now got a two-wheeler, which is electric. So we're seeing a change from the traditional industry of an IC engine to an electric vehicle for two-wheelers. And, and now Ola is venturing into creating a small car. You know, they think it's going to be easy. It could be easy. They could be like the Tesla of the United States, right? But the yeah. impact they have will be tremendous because remember, the impact is at the margin. At the margin, the impact is very high. On the entire base, the impact is slow. Why is Tesla valued $600, $700 billion, even though they must be selling 500,000 electric vehicles in the U.S., when the U.S. sells 17 million vehicles, they're the most valuable uh, company, more than GM and all the thing, because people see the future, Right. So India's two-wheeler industry is getting disrupted from the IC engine to the electric vehicle engine. Now, if you look at the newer banks, a layer of software on top of banks, right? They're all there. If you look at Zeroda, discount broker, disrupted the broking industry. Now, we've got three or four discount brokers. There are maybe, you know, two or 28, 28 30 million people who are day traders today. Everybody has become a discount broker, sure. right? So we are seeing fintechs come up. We are seeing edtech come up. At tech, we got 75 million people who are subscribed to Baiju with about six to seven million paying customers. And that's a lot. The whole education industry has been disrupted in the school area. And like this, in every area of activity, you're finding them disrupting, but they have to grow big. You've got Reliant Geo, which is now disrupting in the grocery industry. 
where you got uh, Amazon fighting, you got Big Basket fighting, you got uh, you know Flipkart fighting, etc. And the entire industry has changed. E-commerce today is a sixty billion dollar industry in this country. So if you look at all that, the change is tremendous. Much more in some areas, much less. So, but remember, you know this. They're growing much, much faster. Three x, four x economic growth rate in nominal mm. terms. If the economy grows 11, 12 percent, they're growing 50, 100 percent, right? So the impact two, three years later is going to be tremendous. Right. So great. So I think you touched on uh, three industries, right? Uh, if I have to, maybe more. But let's start with retail is one, which is e-commerce, which you alluded to. There's a transformative change taking place with these new players coming in. And there's a substitute, substitution taking place from the traditional buying to an e-commerce enabled buying. So there's a value creation taking place, employment. Uh, still, goods goods have to be produced, but retail through that enterprise. Second, you touched on the education. The consumption of the education is uh, transforming itself into uh, into three online patterns. So therefore, there's again uh, employment plus economic value being created in that ecosystem. Then you talked about a different model where you know uh, a company which is in the transportation business, such as or uh, logistics and transportation, which is uh, Ola, uh, creating capital but using that capital for creating a new ecosystem, which is the two-wheeler electronic vehicles being scooters or cars, right? So they're creating an adjacent while creating value by providing a service rather than, um, you know, translating and creating a new kind of an economy. There's some substitution uh, happening there as well. Uh, then you touched on the uh, the fintech, which is the, um, um, you know, the, uh, the new types of brokerages, the new types of... Uh, financial uh, models, which is lending and so on, they are also evolving. So if I take the first three, you know, for example, education, e-commerce, uh, and this new capital formation, I mean, Tesla is a good example of a new capital formation as they try and create adjacent uh, industries. And if you take, you know, either Amazon or if you take, uh, you know, Alphabet or Google, uh, they move one mode into the advertising or Facebook mode into advertising, that is their core revenue, there's a great amount of substitution that occurred. So the question, therefore, is how, I mean, you talked about a small number, which is $10 billion adjacent value, and you expect to see that uh, to be X number uh, as we look at 2025, and that means a percentage of, you know, whether it is 3%, 5%, 6% of GDP when India aspires it to be a $5 trillion economy. Clearly, the IT services is going to be very big, whether it be a $500 billion in that $5 trillion uh, that's a number I think that the industry is aspiring to achieve. So what do you see from an e-commerce enablement engines? How much would that be? Is it 10 percent? Is it 5 percent? Is it 4 percent? And where you see the drivers of value coming from? You know, let me say this to you. What you're finding in the e-commerce phenomena is, one, the substituting the market. That is sure from the traditional route to the e-commerce route. But they're expanding the market tremendously. The biggest growth is coming in tier two, tier three, tier four cities where people are deprived of very good, high-quality goods, primarily because they don't have access to them. And they're investing heavily in supply chain to reduce supply chain costs. You know that India's supply chain cost before GST was 14% of GDP. United States, I think, is 5 China is 6 We are not efficient. Now, is after GST has come down to 12%, with all the roads and everything is coming down to 10%, soon we'll be at 8%. And that is tremendous. So they're expanding the market like that. And third, they're doing a great service by expanding the market and lowering costs. Right now, for example, India sells 250 mobile phones. Now, to distribute 250 mobile phones is going to be very tough. They're able to do that because of e-commerce. And because of huge buying, they created a massive industry, which is now going to export this year about $10 billion of mobile phones to the rest of the world. We suddenly created a huge industry based upon the local market and Indian in incentives to the PLI scheme. So you're we're finding that, you know, what China did, India is doing in a small way. What did China do? China became the outsource factory for the whole world. Yeah. They manufactured masks for the whole world. Because they focus on mass manufacturing, they lower the cost. The lower costs allow them to tackle the local market, which had lesser buying power. Now, in India, we have a large market, but the buying power is very limited. So if you have mass manufacturing and you lower the cost, the market expands exponentially. And that is what we are seeing in the e-commerce industry, because of the mass buying, they are expanding the market, so more people are able to access good goods and services, and the market expands tremendously, 
and then you improve the quality of life for the vast majority of people who could not afford to do anything else. Please remember, that is the China effect. And mm. remember, because of China, your inflation rates are quite low in the United States for very many years, because China was a big, big sink of cheaper labor or more effective labor. Now, we are going to see that impact where we are going to build a local manufacturing base in many items of mass consumption to high levels because of e-commerce. And that will allow us to create the scale of manufacturing using robotics and automation, which India can become a big exporter. Now, we are a very large exporter of two-wheelers because the India market and Bajaj is exporting in a very big way. TVS is exporting in a big way. Hero Honda is exporting in a big way. That's what we need. Now, Hyundai is exporting cars in the small cars in a big way because India makes two and a half million small cars and we make the most cost-effective, high-quality small cars. Our two-wheelers have taken over the Chinese exports to Africa and other countries. So please, so I, for me, there's an expansion of the market in India, there's a creation of scale benefits, and this is enabling the scale to become an export, which you could not do earlier. And today, Amazon, if you look at data, is exporting $2 billion of Indian goods to the e-commerce network globally. Now, Amazon has cracked the problem of supply chain. The biggest advantage China has a fabulous supply chain. Mm. And supply chain is what makes sure that you can supply to the rest of the world to shipping, lower cost, immediate delivery, transparency, blah, blah, blah. Now we are seeing that kind of efficiency come. Right now, I would estimate that on a $3 trillion economy, maybe $10, $15 billion is the value at 0.5% of GDP. Now this should go to maybe 3 to 4% of GDP by 2025. And that is huge. That's a 10x growth in uh, five years. And a 10x growth of this nature in five years, which reduces cost, increases efficiency, increasing is unbelievable transformation. Because see, remember, what India requires is greater efficiency. Yeah. Greater yeah. efficiency. You know, I'll give you another, uh, another instance of what uh, Prime Minister Modi has done. Our railways today are running at 50 kilometers an hour for goods. Three years ago, they're running at 24 kilometers. 24 kilometers an hour. Now they're running at 50 kilometers an hour. The Stop. costs are coming down, right. you, know, the, you know, because of speed. We are having 12,000 HP uh, traction engines taking us, and we are having uh, trains of three, four kilometers in length. So that is a mental transformation. Uh, Indigo and others have got discount airlines, which are just taking up the growth, which is coming back. So what does India require? India requires mass manufacturing, mass distribution, lower cost, create the local base, then become an export center with high quality goods. And we see that actually happening in many areas because of technology, e-commerce, distribution, supply chain, and young entrepreneurs. Yes. So uh, I think so very great points, Mohan, in terms of defining uh, how one needs to look at uh, both technology as well as the Indian startup ecosystem. So if I take away, correct me if I'm wrong, that two clear messages that, that you are delivering here is that in the B2B space, many of the adjacent technologies that evolve from the e-commerce startup ecosystem helps in transformative in terms of driving efficiency in the value chain, but also embedding itself into the global supply chain so that the enabled industries are capable of exporting globally. Is that is that Brilliant. The uh, you put it very well. And you know, Sridhar, here is the point. 250 years ago, a unique event took place which transformed the world. China China and India were the largest economies 250 years ago. The Industrial Revolution took place. The age of the machines came, and machines mass manufactured, lowered the cost, and destroyed the wage base and human muscle base industries of China and India. And then the supply chain was built, and the West controlled the supply chain primarily because they had the shipping, they had the pipelines, they had the trade, they had the retail, wholesale, banking, everything else. And they connected consumers to markets. And that is the supply chain that was there till about 15 years ago. Now with the internet, you know, out of 7.8 billion people on the planet, 5 billion people are on the internet. About you know, 6 billion people have a mobile phone. 4.5 billion people are on social media. Now everybody's on the internet. So we got one single platform, which is powered by e-commerce and supply chain at the back. So the traditional route, which is controlled by a set of people is gone. Now, if you manufacture in India of high quality, you can sell to anywhere in the world just by being on the e-commerce side because the whole world comes to Amazon or Flipkart or Walmart or whatever it is, right? And that is unbelievable 
transformation in the digital revolution. That is the digital revolution which is creating a new model for the digital era. Exactly what you said. Yeah. Thanks, Mohan. So the second summarization I would take away, when you look at the B2C segment, uh, I think you hit it on two ways. One is it is enabling market expansion. That means it is reach into diverse segments of uh, the tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four cities uh, because there is a euphoric or there is a ubiquitous distribution channel and there is a ubiquitous access device which enables these people to be part of the consumption vehicle or consumption chain. So there is a market expansion that is taking place. I think the second attribution that you are, which actually worked in the first phase of India's IT evolution, which is naming, namely the arbitrage of the cost, which is why IT services grew, because cost of delivery became cost and the efficiency of delivery and the globalization became the enablers of the birth of the IT industry, which is today about $200 billion. So here what you are seeing is in the B2C space, the enablement is expanding, is enabling market expansion, but also consumption at a far more efficient cost or effective uh, price. People are able to buy into it. So that is the second. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, just just, just one, one, one second, Mohandas Payore. Uh, viewers, B2C is business to consumer, B2B is business to business. Mohandas Payore, please continue. You know, you know, you know, Sridhar, remember, CK Ranganathan bought the Satchet, a Satchet, small Satchet of costing two rupees, three rupees for, uh, you know, uh, for, for, your, for, your, for washing your hair, for, you know, you understand. And immediately the market expanded. Parle bought that uh, biscuit which cost two rupees, three rupees. Market expanded exponentially. Because remember, in a poor country, the purchase price is low. But if you can give something for a lower purchase price of daily consumption, everybody can consume it every day <laughs> instead of buying. So, you know, in the U.S., you're used to bulk buying because you get cheaper goods, right? Because you got credit. If you didn't have the credit, you can't buy for one month and store it and get 20% off, right? So in India too now, because of e-commerce, everything, people can look at all the goods. It doesn't mean that people in the villages don't have money. They got money. They don't have ability to spend. That's why many of them buy gold, right? When you got surplus money, you used to buy gold. What else can you buy? You can't buy anything. Can you buy a fridge? Getting a fridge from somewhere is so difficult, right? And that's why, you know, Sridhar, India for FMCG is a distribution game. Yep. You got a market game. And the people who distribute like Hindustan Unilever, ITC, are reaping huge profits. Hindustan Unilever, FMCG, operating profit before advertisement is 30%. Show me 30% anywhere, right? Why is that distribution chain? You control the market because you can distribute. And people buy in small quantities, but you distribute. So now e-commerce enabling the distribution and the margins are there. So most consumers will get it cheaper than earlier. They have money that they have will go a long way. And this is a market expansion and consumption expansion. Yeah, yeah, no thank um, uh, Viewers, uh, subject matter experts will jump in with acronyms. So I'm trying to keep things up here clear. FMCG stands for Fast Moving Consumer Goods. Uh, Sridharji, your next question. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Mohan, I think uh, you touched on this because those of us who have come from the traditional distribution, um, we saw this disruption. Uh, if you take the case of a bank or if you take the case of a Walmart, we controlled end to end the distribution chain. You can go to a branch. You can go to an ATM. Walmart, you can go to your store and the store is to be located in a specific location. Digitization has enabled unbundling of the distribution chain, unbundling of distribution. In other words, you don't need to own it to manage it. As long as you have access to it and you have the ability to deliver leveraging it, then you become the kingmaker in terms of pushing, marketing, you know, productizing and uh, commercializing the enterprise. So what you're saying is, that India has jumped into, from a mass access point of view, using the digital revolution, an open distribution model, or what we call an open retailing model, where every participant who has something to offer can come in and lock himself into it, and then he will be able to be successful if he can back his execution with 
um, if he can back his promise with execution on top of the brand. This is where India is heading in terms of the transformative model. Absolutely. I'll give another example, Sridhar. Today, 85% of all banking transactions are electronic. People don't have to visit a bank. 2.8 billion transactions for money transfer happen on the UPI. You, you, you know, you know, you know uh, the payment interface, unified yeah. payment interface. At no cost, at no cost. That means the amount the banks are charging for transferring money is gone. Now, we got international remittance, which is coming in at a fraction of the cost it was there much earlier. So who is saving the money? The small small saver, the small person is saving money in all these banking transactions, right? And yeah. this has enabled banks to be much more efficient and leverage technology. And you can imagine the multiplier effect that it will have. Sridhar, we have got in India, I think, 13% uh, 13, 13 of currency in circulation. Now, the checks are coming down. Checks may become scarce or maybe historic, uh, maybe in five years' time because everybody is transferring through the mobile. And in the business, you're doing electronic transfer 24 into 7, Sridhar. We can transfer money 24 into 7, Sridhar. There is no time limit. When the banks are sleeping, we can transfer money. Look at India, how what has become totally electronic all over. Amazing. And Sridhar, Amazing. all this being the velocity of money will increase. Now, yeah. cash in hand in an economy is dead money. Yeah. It doesn't earn you anything. If the cash in circulation comes down and it goes into the banking system as deposits or as payments, etc., then you can imagine that the cost of money will come down and have another big benefit, right? So I think we're seeing all these building blocks of efficiency come in a very inefficient economy. No, I think, uh, you know, the clearly the payment innovation uh, and the creation of uh, UPI um, and unilateral connectivity into the banking system, the back end of the banking systems, has not only enhanced India's uh, enablement of three categories of transactions. Uh, one is obviously the ability to move money between people and business. So that's one transaction. You know, in the United States, we struggled for almost eight to nine years using uh, what we call as the old credit card payment systems to enable commerce. So we took a longer time to actually digitize commerce uh, in an e-commerce way, but we were vastly using what we call MOTO, money audit, uh, you know, telephone audit type of transaction. So India has clearly moved further ahead and has automated, which is also driving the e-commerce transformative evolution in India. I think the third, which we are also seeing in India, uh, is the international remittances. So India is a number one destination today in international remittances. The many of the startup players who have come in are playing a pivotal role and within 20 minutes, the money is reaching the bank account of the individual. That's phenomenal. Imagine uh, the, uh, you know, your bank to bank payment system rather than your Western Union, which cost, which used to cost an average 30 to $40 to move money from here to there. And today you can get it. If it's thousand dollars, it's free. If it is less than thousand dollars, for two dollars ninety nine or a three dollars ninety nine, you can move money. So I think it's important that the because I get a lot of questions, which is to say, is this euphoric and disillusionment or is this real? So I think the delineation has to be, you know, people like uh, yourself who are the ambassadors of the Indian ecosystem is where could the disillusion come from? You know, the question that came up is, is Romato real? Is this disillusion? You know, are we going to all lose money? So the question, therefore, is that needs to be answered within the context we say. One is to delineate the disruptive transformation and the transformative economic model that the e-commerce or the Indian startups are enabling. Second is the valuation, which is a completely different game, which is more about investments, and the valuation as is determined by the appropriate people. That can toggle depending on the market conditions, but that has nothing to do with the transformation that is taking place. So that's something that uh, you can expand further on that, Mohan, and deliver some message to the audiences. You know, today, across all industries, we're seeing transformation. You know, warehouses are being run by robots, just like in the West. Our car manufacturing plants have got a huge amount of robotics. Efficiency has gone up everywhere, just like in Tesla. And then if you go and see 
any other manufacturing. For example, I'm on the board of Havels. We have a plant near Delhi, which is run by robots, and uh, the cost of production is less than China, fully automated. You go to the plant, they've got robots doing, lesser people, quality is there, and robots don't ask for salary raises, right? They work 24 into 7, right? So you can have three shifts, and you know, the cost comes down dramatically. So what happens in China, it can be done here. So we got the money to invest, we invest, and we are very efficient, we can scale up to very large extent. Now, you can understand what that means for a country like India across all kind of industries uh, going through. So it is transformative. Now, you're talking about valuation. You know, Zomato has gone up. Why has Zomato gone up? One, there's scarcity value. It's the first of the lot to come. There is brand value. And there is glamour. I want to own a piece. And then see the new capital is coming in, see the you know, there's a lot of disruptive capital in the world. Central banks expanded the balance sheet by $25 trillion. $20 trillion is the stimulus all around the world. There's a lot of surplus liquidity. And a new kind of capital, which is not in India, the technology-based capital is coming in. They're buying the stock. They're holding on. And this value chain is a function of growth. It's a matter of way to grow 80%, 90% in revenue this year compared to the previous year. All these questions about value chain will go away. I remember Infosys once had a PE of 200, 200. But in that time, we doubled from 100 million to 200 million to 400 million. In two years, 100 to 200 to 400 with a 30% net margin. So this valuation is all a function of growth. People expect very high growth. Now, you know, see that in the financial markets, valuation goes ahead of value creation. Then the market falls. Value creation catches up, then valuation catches up again. It's a, it's a cycle that goes on. But the, whether the cycle is long or short depends on growth rates. Right, right. So now we, we all believe the internet company's growth rate is going to be very high, maybe three, four times the economic growth rate for the next maybe four to five years. And that is what is driving value. Indeed. Uh, Sridharji, uh, if you could just explain PE ratio and valuation and then ask the next question. Um, uh, P is uh, price to earnings uh, and uh, valuation is, you know, if you have invested $1 in a company, what do the people believe the company's value to be? And Mohanji pointed out that the, there are at least few factors, you know, what is your revenue, how your revenue has grown, whether you have added, you know, some kind of esoteric brand value, are you in a unique market position where you can continue to show sustained growth? So it is the premium that people are willing to pay, and that's what drives the valuation up based on a set of financial and non-financial parameters in terms of the ability to increase business. So Infosys, as the example he said, basically demonstrated that they can grow from 100 to 200, 200 to 400. The market then rewards the stakeholders, and the market then rewards the company by saying, we believe that you are you know, fair value should be such and such number. So this is the, uh, you know, the price linked to the earnings. That is the PE number that Mohanji is alluding to. Okay. So now the reason that you are this, this concept that people have still questions and incorrectly compare the, what you, what I call as the uh, disillusionment phase, you know, you have euphoria, you have ecstasy, then you have disillusionment before you begin to have enlightenment. This disillusionment is when everything crashes. So in, in, in United States between 99 and 2003, we went from euphoria to a complete disillusionment because we were grading values for anybody eyeballs, you know, impressions, clicks, but they, could, didn't tan, they did not translate into tangible economic value. But we still were rewarding them and then we realized, my God, this is a problem. And that is the reason why the markets kind of crash. There's nothing uh, structural underlying that. So whenever people are looking at the, uh, you know, whether it is Zomato or any of these companies, it's probably inappropriate to compare them with Zio and other places, you know, where there's far more uh, tangible, you know, uh, uh, capital plant equipment, machinery and other kinds of things. You need to look at what the underlying parameters of revenue, revenue growth, market expansion, um, and other kind of adjacent opportunities. If you take Uber here, for example, it has translated into Uber Eats. If you take, for example, the contrary, WeWork, 
when everything went, it kind of collapsed because it had no alternative mechanism. So that's how I would uh, ask people in India who have raised this question uh, to look at this valuation, but not blindly walk into it. But I think Mohanji is alluding to is that there is a gradual pace and even Zomato has underlying economic parameters that is driving its PU, which is why the market is uh, rewarding them. That's the message that is coming through. My last question before we give it to our audiences is employment. If you go back in time, two, three years ago, we said the transformation, digitization, all this is going to take. Mohan, you yourself have written papers that it is, we are going to have a huge disruption in the employment market. Have you changed your mind and do you see more employment opportunities uh, being available? Sridhar, my yes. view is very simple. The United States will see growth to two and a half percent. Productivity per year because of technology can be higher than two, two and a half percent, except in retail, other areas which require people. So definitely in mature industries, automation, AI is going to reduce the number of jobs, financial service and all that. You're seeing it happen for the last 15 years. In 15 years, 15 million middle class jobs are gone by automation. But India is a growing economy. We'll grow six and a half, seven, eight percent a year for the next 10, 15, 20 years. Because we need more houses, we need more roads, we need more cars, we need more fuel, we need more and more because people don't have the ability to consume. So just the growth itself is going to produce jobs. But the key is with technology and automation, the percentage increase in jobs for a percentage increase in GDP is going to be lesser than when it was manual. But what is going to translate into is that is going to translate into lower costs and a much more competitive economy which will expand the market because of lower costs, which in result will increase higher consumption and make up a part of that. And that is what is going to benefit the country and make sure that whatever people earn, they're able to get good value for the money when they spend it as consumers, right? Now yep. we are in the growth phase. So I do think per unit of GDP growth, the amount of valuation by labor will come down. And that is, that is going to happen. And for India, we we'll still have higher employment than the U.S., growth in employment than the U.S., because we will grow at a much, much faster rate than the U.S., which is, you know, peaked. And I think, you know, we will grow at 2 to 1 percent because population growth rate is less. Our population growing at 1.1 percent. The U.S. now, I'm told, is growing at 0.35 percent. Unless you open your borders, which I'm sure you'll do, and get the whole South America to go. And there are a lot of people in India who want to come to America, the land of their dreams, to stay there. I'm sure President Biden is going to allow like the Statue of Liberty, the great unwashed masses from all of the world to come and increase the population of the U.S. three from 335 million to a billion people in 10 years to grow your economy. Welcome, Sri. So I think, you know, uh, we, we are in a different situation and America should increase its population by welcoming people from the world to grow your economy. We are wholeheartedly welcoming people. We are moving them in buses. We are flying them in planes. We are giving them houses. We are giving them what you call a starting your life kits. We are giving them a bounty depending on which state, ranging from 11,000 to 13,500. We are giving everything. By the way, we are all great people. Great people. Huh? You are a great, great people. We are so happy that you're welcoming everybody from around the world. Keep it up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mohan. Thank you. So uh, thank you so much, Mohan. Now we uh, just uh, take a uh, uh, you know transition and uh, Shinji, questions from your side or from the audience's side, Shinji? Yes, uh, I have a few questions from the audience side. But before that, I have a small uh, question for uh, Mohandas Payavari. If you look at the Zomato model, um, other than the software, everything else is not for them. They are not owning that. The delivery guy has to own the car. Um, the food is being supplied by A and delivered to the consumer. And, and, and therefore, if you look at the business model, whether you take Zomato or Uber, um, the, the valuation, what do you look at for the valuation for a company like Zomato or in, in future like Ola? Uh, how do you come up with the number saying it is worth so much, therefore the stock is should be priced at this? I just want... 20,000 foot level, because I'm just trying to see as a VC, how would you assign value? Sridhar, I mean, Sri, you know, these are fixed cost model, which require a certain amount of money to be spent because of technology costs and everything else. Then you have high variability of the cost. 
then so long as you have a contribution, that is your revenue minus the variable cost, and the contribution grows at a massive pace, at 3x or 4x your current revenue, because the fixed cost will not grow at the same pace, you'll cover the fixed cost. Then after that, uh, everything goes to the bottom line and you become profitable. So this is a volume game where because of technology, you have to spend in advance. And what do you spend in advance? What you would have spent in 10 years to create that kind of revenue, you're spending in two years. And all of it is revenue expenditure because you don't have plant and equipment and land because it's all software. And you must know that in 2019, the world spent $2 trillion on digitization. Most of it will not be on the balance sheet of companies earlier, but the value of the company will be up because it has intellectual property. Now, accounting does not recognize intellectual property like it recognizes land and building, etc., because it's a very complex topic. So for me, can Zamato grow 5x in two years? The probability is maybe 80-90%. If they grow 5x in two years, will they be cash flow positive? The probability is very high. And will they be able to put up? And will they transform? Second, Right now, they own millions of customers because they got the addresses, they know how to deliver to them, they connect restaurants, charge the restaurant, and deliver. Tomorrow, they can set up their own cloud kitchens. They set up their own cloud kitchens and offer food from their own cloud kitchens. And that means what they produce in the cloud kitchen, mass production, the valuation will go to them instead of going to the restaurant. Right? So I think you know there are a lot of possibilities there. And next, lastly, because they deliver, they know all of you, they know where you stay. They can deliver not only food, they can deliver everything else. They can become a courier service because, you know, they got a delivery mechanism. They can become a, a service to give you any banking documentation, anything that you want that has to be given to people. They can because they know your address, they know where you are, they know what you do, everything else. And by doing data analytics, they know exactly the consumer behavior uh, that is there. And based on the consumer behavior, they can sell that intelligence and the data to, you know, increase the penetration of goods and services, right? They know Sri is a high buyer. He buys the choicest foods. You know, he buys the most expensive food. That means Sri is a very, has got a high income. So then they can sell him perfume. They can sell him everything else because they know the Sri has got a high income, right? Other, how will people know? So there are a lot of possibilities for them to do because it's all about data, it's all about owning the customer, understanding their behavior. How they use it to enhance revenue is something that they have to do. Thank you very much, Mohandas Payare. Uh, Sridharji, would you like to add to that? No, I think uh, Mohanji has uh, 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 quite appropriately explained uh, you know, how do you uh, determine, how as a venture capitalist you determine your valuation uh, attribute. Um, you know, you look at the current state, we call it as the, the source of capital, the use of capital, and the outcomes from the capital. So if I am able to apply $10 million towards a business across, let's say, three, four categories, marketing, product, engineering, and resources, then say in 12 months to 18 months from today, this 10 million achieves these specific set of metrics, whatever those metrics that we define. Then we say we have moved the company from a current number of 1 million to what we believe to be $3 million valuation. So in other words, we are prepared to invest that money and make sure those use, the, the use of capital is applied and the outcomes are accomplished. So when we do the next round of capital raise, we say we met those guidelines by the way, we are not going to raise the capital at 2x, but we are going to now do it at 2.5x because execution is the key underlying driver for valuation enhancements because it answers all questions. The validity of the value proposition, the application of the product, and the capital utilization of the capital for achieving an outcome. That means it has been harnessed. This is what we look at in determining the valuation we, we set up an aspirational desire, we track it, and then when we raise the next round, we believe we do that. So when Mohanji explains, will it be cash flow positive? They have done the modeling and they say, yes, 85% possibility cash flow positive. Will it grow by valuation? Uh, well, three years, sorry. So the story is, will it grow? Yes, the answer is yes. So when the venture capitalist is satisfied with himself, 
then he goes in and they lock up. So the lockup means that there is a euphoric demand for which there is no supply. So it is a supply-demand economics of the market equilibrium, which in turn determines, am I willing to pay the premium because I see some progress in the evolution. So you know, this point so goes on and on and on. Sorry, Mohan. See, you're seeing a gray beard. Give a logical explanation to you. You're again a gray beard, you know, based on your experience. Now, you must call a young man, 25, 30, who's running a seed fund and ask him, a uh, young man or woman, why are you investing in this company? You'll get a very different answer. And what is the answer? Oh, they're going to get all these customers. They've got a huge number of customers. They can sell this. They can do that. Blah, blah, blah. And all that. See, they're very different point of view. Please remember, okay? And all the entrepreneurs in the startup system are very young. They see the world very differently from Sridhar and me. Maybe we try to justify our investment case. For them, it's a very different view. So I think, you know, next time when you talk about startups, you must call Pranav or Siddharth, you know, who run 314 Capital with $250 million and ask them, how do you invest? Why do you invest? Give an example. You get a very refreshing, different view. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, we will take you up on that offer. Pranav, you are getting a phone call. And, and so, so are you, Siddharth. Um, let's take some questions from the customers. I mean, from our viewers. I beg your pardon. The first question is, for you, Mohandas Paiji, uh, Abhijit Sabarwal wants to know, I want to present my pitch deck. Kindly let me know how to reach out to you. We are an <laughs> ED tech startup. Well, I know she will give you my email, send it to me, and I will look and give you my opinion. All right. Okay, sir. Thank you so much. Let's move on. Next question from Aditi Pathak. I have lived in Bay Area and Bengaluru. Bay has excellent support ecosystem for startups. In Bengaluru, I am never sure how to reach out to potential partners. Can you please give some guidelines for aspiring entrepreneurs in Bengaluru? Well, you, you see, you have to become part of networks. There is the Thai network. There are other incubators. You have to make an effort to become part of networks and network with all of them. You want to reach out to people. You know, there are formal networks, established network, and there are a lot of networks in the Bay Area because it's a very mature system, right? The discovery process is very mature. The discovery process is expanding and growing in this country, but there are large networks which are there. When I started off with Ranjan Pai investing, uh, our first investment was in Baiju. Remember, Sri, we invested $9 million at $20 million pre in Baiju. Today, there were $16 million. We had 30%. We diluted early. If you held on, it have been what one and a half billion dollars for nine million today in nine years, right? There are no systems there. It's just our judgment and we give the money. But I want to say to everybody is you must be part of the network, part of the system, reach out. There are enough people. Today is much better. And it's not the same as the Bay Area, let me tell you. It's much less, but it's still growing and still substantial. Next question, uh, Manish Sahu. How can India develop in electronics industry sector? similar to Shenzhen in the next 20 years as silicon is fundamental to IT. No, no, I agree with you. See, there are, there are two things to do. India has more than 200, Bangalore has more than 250 chip designers and testers. So when you see a chip, the design and the testing would have happened in Bangalore for most of the global chip. There are more than 270 multinationals working in Bangalore. We don't have a chip fabrication plant. There are only few chip fabrication plants. Even the U.S. found that most of the chips are manufactured outside in Taiwan or, there, or in China or somewhere else in the middle in, in, in Southeast Asia. Now they're trying to grow five to six chip manufacturing plants and Biden, President Biden has got a big program, right? India doesn't have one. I wish the government of India will incentivize people. They got an incentive where they say we'll invest one billion. Nobody believes that. So they got to get a private sector like a Reliance, Mukesh Ambani, or the Tatas, or possibly Prenji, to come and say, hey, I'm going to invest $5 billion, they got enough money, and tie up with TSMC or somebody else to start a chip manufacturing plant. Because we have a huge market. We consume 250, mobile, 250 million mobile phones. We consume more than 15 to $20 billion of telecom hardware. Our IoT devices are expanding. We got a huge auto industry, two wheelers and others, which use a lot of chips. The so chip demand is enormous, but we don't have a chip manufacturing. And now what government has done is, they have a PLI scheme to expand electronics. See, if you want an electronic industry, you've got to get all the component manufacturers. 
electronic is assembly with IP being done and the brand being done owned by somebody. So unless you have this component manufacturer, by PLI, government is incentivizing big companies to come and manufacture, get all the component manufacturers, they expand it. Today, about 25% of the value of a mobile phone is there in India. It will possibly go up to 50% in the next five years because government is incentivizing and the local market is expanding. So we have understood how the system works and hopefully in five years' time, we'll be exporting 45 to $50 billion of electronics. Now for a chip, we require somebody big to tie up with somebody big to get it because India has lost out. We had a chip fabrication plant in Chandigarh 25 years ago. The government screwed up by big time. They screwed up big time. We had it. We were among the pioneers. But you know, this government doesn't understand. Delhi doesn't understand what a chip is, why it is strategy. For defense, you require chips. Everything is gone electronic street. Thank you very much, Mohandas Pai Avre. Um, Rudraksh Avasti wants to know, is electrification enough for Ola to compete in the auto industry? Electrification is not a disruptive innovation on its own. No, I think electric vehicles are very disruptive because one, it lowers the cost of ownership and two, it reduces pollution and three, very importantly, it disrupts the entire auto component industry. Now, what is the electric vehicle? There's an electric motor and a control system and a chassis. Now, the electric motor has got 20 moving parts. It will last 500,000 kilometers. An IC engine has got 2,000 moving parts. Every after 100,000 kilometers, you've got to change it, breaks down, everything else, right? It's a very different technology. And once you have autonomous cars where artificial intelligence is put into the electric vehicle, you don't have to own a car. On an app, you can call a car and you can go in the car. The car will drive by itself. It's going to happen maybe in three to four years' time. We are at stage three or four out of stage five to make that happen. And once that happens, you know, you'll find that car ownership will change dramatically because car usage will go up. Today, you use the car only 10% of the time. See how you own a car, what percent of time in 24 hours you use the car? One hour, two hours, three hours? And then 10% of real estate in America used for car parking. There's enormous wastage of capital and ownership because of this ownership concept for an asset which is mainly kept idle, right? Now, when the electric vehicle comes, when artificial intelligence use, autonomous cars come, it transforms the entire industry substantially. Now, what Ola is doing is giving you a mere electric vehicle. Now, based on the electric vehicle, there'll be IoT devices. They will find out the patterns, and then they will start leasing it out to you. You will have a business model innovation. In Bangalore, we have an investment in a company called Yulu. Yulu has got a two-wheeler in multiple points. You come out from the metro, use the Yulu, go park somewhere, and go away. And you only pay for the 10 minutes that you use, right? You don't own it. Because your needs are being met. Why should you own anything? Now, that will be the next stage for Ola. Thank you very much. And this is the last question. Um, Sridharji, what I'd like to do is, after this question is asked, I'll kind of have you cover overall what we kind of learned from this conversation. So you can recap for us. Because people are not saying who the question was directed at. But I'm just guessing that many of these things, because they are Bengaluru-centric, I'm asking uh, Nishant Das. I'm mean, sorry, I'm asking uh, Mohandas Payare. Nishant Das wants to know what premium entrepreneurs can enjoy in India over San Francisco. Why should I start in India if I get better everything in SFO? Let me tell you, my friend, you should start an enterprise wherever you feel you get the best value. There are no loyalties in business. If San Francisco gives you better value, go there. If London gives you better value, go there. Be successful, become a billionaire, that should be your aim. Now, don't go by thinking, I'm going to transform India, I'm going to do this, because if you're a failure, nobody cares a damn for you. Look after yourself, go to that place in the world where you will make the most money, where you'll be the most successful, and decide for yourself. And then you suffer the consequences of your decision either way. I mean, that's my view, Sridhar. Sridharji, your point. No, I think that the uh, uh, Mohan has responded to uh, the the question quite aptly. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, everything boils down to the entrepreneur and his ability to holistically think about from concept design to how he can commercialize and generate an economic outcome out of it. So, you know, I can be in the middle of Austin. 
or I can be in the middle of Alabama, uh, or I could be, uh, you know, in Charlotte, or I could be in maybe in Pune, or I could be in Hyderabad, I could be, you know, in Melbourne, Australia, I could be anywhere. So I think that the ecosystem is a natural and harmonious evolution where you find that the e-commerce is now today or the digital innovation is pervasive across the globe. You can even go to Thailand. You have workspace spots and spaces where you can even meet people because everything today is, you know, use and pay. Use and pay and congregate. Collaborate, socialize, use, consume and pay. So there's nothing kind of uh, uh, we are fixed about it. So therefore, I think that it totally left is left to the individual entrepreneur as to how he builds this. That would be my uh, my response. I mean, you know, I've seen this in quite a few countries around the world. Uh, so is it, uh, that's, uh, that's that's. So if we if we have no further questions, then we can wrap up. Uh, very la last question. Very last question, sir. Um, this is for both of you. First, I'll let uh, Sridhar ji answer, and then we will go to Mohandas Pai. After he answers, you can summarize, sir. Sridhar ji, Aditi Pathak wants to know. When you make a decision on investment, do you prefer founders from IITs and IIMs? What do you look into other than revenue potential when making the decision? I think the first and foremost we look at is the idea, whether the idea is uh, relevant to the market and whether there is a mapping between a market need and the idea that is being conceived. That's number one. Number two is we look for the entrepreneur, which is to say, uh, you know, what is his intensity and passion to take this journey uh, and convert and translate from idea into an outcome? So we need to hear from him how he is going to go about it. And the third that we look for is, does he have capacity, uh, you know, to use money, uh, to put resources and then mix money and resources to produce an outcome. Uh, and what is his reach around the ecosystem for him to assemble this? Uh, and then we say, okay, he has all the kind of necessary ingredients where we can believe. Uh, and of course, sometimes, uh, not sometimes, we do look at who the other investors are and so on and so forth. That makes uh, you know a fairly reasonable case. If he doesn't have other investors, we have what we call as uh, angel funding and friends and family funding. So you take a leap of faith and put the money into the individual where you are prepared to test and accept in these instances. You know, if you put 10, maybe one or two may be successful, but you're willing to put that risk capital in that from that early evolution. We have incubated companies with, you know, friends and family business where we have put money, where in, in some instances, all 10 out of 10, it goes out of the window. But that is, uh, you know, risk investing in venture capital business. Uh, Mohandas Payavre, what are your parameters for funding? No, I think the basic parameter is idea, then the individual. It doesn't matter where the individual is coming from. If the individual understands the business, can they execute, what is the passion and energy, doesn't matter about the gender, what matters is, are they capable of achieving that? Yeah. Because, you know, there's in, there's a, there is more intelligence outside the IIT system than in the IITs. We know that, right? And I think it's very important uh, to understand that the individual is important, but the idea. You could be the brightest guy in the world, but you don't have the foggiest idea about business. It's not going to succeed. And then third thing is, you have a team. Every successful startup requires a visionary who has the idea and who can get people together, requires a hacker who is a techie, and requires a hustler who is a marketing guy. And these are important attributes. And you need a team. I would like to have a team. I don't like to go with one individual because you like to have a team. The risk is too high. And, you know, if you do that. And lastly, see, for startups, it's all about your ability to raise capital. Can you impress people to raise capital? Because you may be the brightest guy who can't communicate, great, great tech, but if you can't raise capital, then, you know, it's not, a, it's not going to grow. Uh, thank you very much, Mohandas Pai Aure. That was a scintillating session. And uh, Sridhar Ji, you are concluding thoughts before we wrap this up. No, uh, first and foremost, thanks Mohanji uh, or Mohan uh, because he's my very dear friend. Uh, so I'm taking the liberty here. Uh, I think it's an excellent session. So he, uh, it's an enlightening session within the construct of how you look at the development in e-commerce, uh, evolution of e-commerce or digital or startup ecosystem in India. 
uh, digital ecosystem is real and it is India has evolved and is the third largest. I won't be surprised in five years. It is uh, this, it, it is it translates itself to be the second largest ecosystem. Uh, it has received tremendous amount of capital. Uh, if I am right, the first half of uh, 2021, India received 10.6 or 11 billion dollars of uh, new capital by way of investment into the venture capital ecosystem. So it is real. Uh, in five years, three years, as the case may be, it, uh, the valuation of the companies is expected to be one trillion dollars, which also implies that there is a maturing ecosystem in India in terms of the ideation to conceptualization, conceptualization to execution, and then of course, you know, this concept of 150 UCONs is just a parameter, which is to say these companies are more than one billion dollars in value. In terms of the specific applications of um, the digital innovation, uh, I think the key summary and key takeaway listening to uh, Mohan is that it is about a transformative uh, changes, whether it is B2B or whether it is B2C. B2B is about enabling all the e-commerce or digital non-digital platforms to be digitally enabled to be integrated into local and global supply chains so that there is an expansion happening at a lower cost and a better efficiency from, um, from, from what you call order to delivery point of view, which is very important in the transformation of the B2B. The B2B ecosystem in China happened without the digitization of the supply chain. India will do it with digitization of the supply chain and the PLI schemes that Modi ji, this is my pitch, has targeted, has targeted around the electronic industry, which is ideal for digitization and transformation relative to the other forms of industries. Now, in coming to the second phase in terms of the business to consumer or direct to consumer, what you're seeing is, what I'm hearing is that it is more about market expansion, it is about pricing efficiency, it is about delivering the produce to a more set of audiences who were unable to have access to these products. That's where the incremental value creation is coming. The final point is that it would be about three to 5% of the GDP contribution by 2025. In the five trillion economy, it would probably be worth $150 billion to about $250 billion. This is my takeaway from Mohan's, uh, uh, what you call uh, wise words. If I miss something, Mohan, you can uh, you can wrap it up. Yes, Mohan. Well, <coughs> absolutely brilliant, Sir. You summed it up very well. Thank you. Thanks, Mohan. And with that, we and bring. I want to. I just want to say, Sri. You know, I was part of the software service industry from '94. I saw the growth of a great country whose GDP went up from 275 billion in '91 to three trillion dollars in 2020. I saw the rise of a great company like Infosys, whose value went up from 40 crores to 6,75,000 crores today, from 92, 40 crores to 6,75,000 crores. I saw the rise of a great IT service industry, whose revenue went up from $50 million to $170 billion this year. Now, I'm seeing the rise of another great industry, the startup industry. So life is exciting. I see maybe 100, invest, 100 entrepreneurs every month or so, I review companies. There's so much of excitement, so much of positivity, so much of growth, so much of technology in Bangalore is astounding. Thank you very much. That about sums it up. And as always, it's a pleasure having you, Mohandas Pai Avre, on our platform. And Sridhar Ji, thanks for asking really incisive questions of our guest today. And we will be back with such fireside chats very, very soon. And stay tuned and Namaskar. Namaskar and thank you everybody. Thank you Mohan for uh, being part of this great discussion for an hour and five minutes.